F-16 Fighting Falcon has been the US Air Force's workhorse fighter for more than 40 years, and at one point, it looked like a carrier-capable version would do the same for the US Navy. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. More than 4,600 F-16s have rolled out of the assembly line since it first took to the sky in 1974, and even amid this era of stealthy supercomputers like the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the F-16 Force remains the backbone of America's air dominance. With some 1,245 of this fighter still in operation under the Air Force's banner, the F-16's broad multi-role capabilities and sheer performance make it one of the world's top fighter jets, even if it is almost old enough for a senior citizen's discount. Today, F-16s fly for the United States, Israel, Pakistan, Turkey, Egypt, the Netherlands, Norway, Belgium, and more. But the most surprising place this highly capable fourth-generation fighter may have ended up is on the deck of America's supercarriers. You see, shortly after the F-16 won the Air Force's new Air Combat Fighter, or ACF, contract back in 1975, the Pentagon pushed the Navy to adopt this new fighter for their purposes as well. The F-16 had performed really well in its pursuit of that Air Force contract, and if the Navy could also find a use for the Fighting Falcon, the Pentagon reasoned that they could buy the jet in higher numbers and streamline the logistics for both branches, making everything just a little bit cheaper. Now that might sound familiar, because this line of thinking was of course what would eventually lead to the acquisition boondoggle that has been the F-35, which was also intended to be a single fighter platform that could meet the disparate needs of the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps, as well as some foreign buyers. The F-16 then could have become a similar quagmire, or maybe it may have proven the concept sound, that is, if the Vought Model 1600, or the carrier-capable F-16, had ever actually made it into service. But let's skip back to that ACF competition in 1975, because in order for the YF-16 to find its destiny as the Air Force's workhorse fighter, it first had to contend with some pretty stiff competition in the form of Northrop's YF-17. The YF-17 was a lightweight prototype fighter, first designed to serve as a lower-cost alternative to America's most dominant air superiority fighter of the modern era, the F-15 Eagle. In the minds of military leaders, the large, powerful, and expensive F-15 brought more power to bear than was really necessary for many combat operations, and as such, a cheaper but still highly capable jet could complement America's fleet of eagles by assuming those lower stakes roles. Ultimately, the YF-16 would outperform Northrop's YF-17 and testing oriented specifically towards the Air Force's needs, but it wouldn't be the last time these two highly capable platforms would find themselves competing over a contract. In fact, as the Navy mulled over the idea of converting the F-16 for carrier use, it once again found stiff competition in the form of Northrop's YF-17. It's important to note that neither General Dynamics, who was making the F-16, nor Northrop, who made the YF-17, had ever built a carrier fighter before. So, with this lucrative contract on the line, both firms sought out partners with carrier aircraft experience. General Dynamics teamed up with Vought to convert their new F-16 Fighting Falcon into the Vought Model 1600. Northrop paired off with McDonnell Douglas to improve upon their own YF-17 design. The new iterations of both of these fighters had to place a larger emphasis on the Navy's primary needs at the time, namely long-range radar capabilities for intercept missions and multi-role capabilities to support the sort of air-to-ground combat operations that America has really come to leverage heavily throughout the past few decades. It may seem counterintuitive today, with the F-16 so expertly filling the role of an attack aircraft as well as a fighter, but the original concept behind the F-16 was to create a no-frills fighter built to do nothing but dominate the skies. 
The team responsible for the F-16 at General Dynamics, some of whom were known as the lightweight fighter mafia, sought to keep the gold plating they believed common in new fighter programs away from this new jet. Gold plating, in their minds, included a number of things we now think of as practically standard in any 4th or 5th generation fighter. Things like fire control radar, electronic countermeasures for flying in contested airspace, radar-guided missiles, and maybe most importantly, ground attack capabilities. But maybe luckily in hindsight, by the time the F-16A began to emerge, it would indeed have some of that gold plating the fighter mafia so disdained. Things like an AN-APG-66 radar and some intrinsic ground attack capabilities. But not to leave the fighter mafia entirely out in the cold, it did still lack radar-guided air-to-air -air weapons, which it skipped in favor of the heat-seeking Sidewinder. These changes did make the F-16 a better candidate for the Navy's needs than it would have been as originally imagined, but it still didn't quite fit the bill. In order to meet the needs of the Navy, the Vought 1600 was to be larger than the F-16A, stretching some three feet longer. It also had a 33-foot, three-inch wingspan, which was about two feet broader than the Air Force's version of the fighter. The breadth of the wings grew, covering a total of 269 feet and giving the aircraft better stability at lower speeds. The fuselage was flattened a bit and made broader, and its canopy was designed to pivot forward, which was different from the F-16, but can now be found on the F-35. In order to withstand carrier landings, the Vought 1600 needed sturdier landing gear, as well as other standard carrier equipment like a landing hook. The fuselage was reinforced to withstand the incredible forces carrier fighters are subjected to, and to meet the engagement range the Navy needed, a pulse Doppler radar for beyond visual range targeting was also added. When they were through, the structural changes needed to make the F-16 into the first Vought 1600 added more than 3,000 pounds to the aircraft. And then further changes were made to the fuselage and wings as subsequent iterations of the design came to fruition. The V-1602, as one example, had even more wing area at 399 square feet, and as a result was given a heavier GE F-101 engine. But despite all of these changes made to the F-16 to meet the Navy's needs, the combined General Dynamics Vought effort would ultimately lose out to Northrop and McDonnell Douglas and their YF-17. We'd later come to know that fighter today as the F-A-18 Hornet, and its own successor, the Block II Super Hornet. The YF-17 may not have cut it for the Air Force, but the Navy saw promise in a scaled-up version of the fighter thanks to its superior range and maybe its safety. You see, the Vought 1600's low-lying intake, which was located just above the nose wheel, was considered a real risk on the flight deck of the Navy's flat tops, as it could literally suck unsuspecting sailors straight into it. Now, this isn't the first time Vought faced this sort of criticism, as the pilot favorite, Vought F-8 Crusader, also had a large, low intake that earned it the nickname The Gator, because it could literally gobble up sailors. But it was also the F-16's lack of radar-specific weapons that really made it poorly suited for the all-weather operations you'd expect of a fighter aboard one of America's flat tops. I'm going to quote former Chief of Naval Operations Admiral James L. Holloway here from his book Aircraft Carriers at War, a personal retrospective of Korea, Vietnam, and the Soviet confrontation. Quote, I pointed out that the F-16 carried only AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles, and they were clear air mass missiles. In clouds, a radar missile like the AIM-7 Sparrow III was required. This capability, with the necessary radar guidance system and heavier pylons, had been incorporated into the F-18 design. But the F-16 would not accommodate an all-weather missile system without extensive redesign and added weight. And you'd think that would be the end of the story, but it wasn't. Because according to Holloway's book, Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger was still dead set on pushing the Vought 1600 onto the Navy, whether they liked it or not. So in order to settle this debate once and for all, Schlesinger invited Admiral Holloway to his office for them to talk it out. 
When he extended the invitation, he told him that his office was pretty small, so don't bring more than two subordinates with you for the discussion. It was an ambush. Holloway walked into the defense secretary's office to find more than a dozen people waiting for him. You could contend that Schlesinger was really trying to use superior numbers to bully the Navy into adopting the Vault 1600. But like the Spartans at Thermopylae, Holloway stood firm, highlighting the concerns of his engineers, things like how the Vought 1600 was apt to bang its engine on the flight deck during carrier landings, which would really cause damage to both the flight deck and the aircraft. But Schlesinger's gang argued that problems like that could be mitigated with better pilot techniques. Holloway grew frustrated. Clearly, anybody preaching about improved pilot technique to offset a fighter's design shortcomings had never attempted to land on the pitching deck of an aircraft carrier, let alone one that was barely visible against a seemingly endless backdrop of stormy seas and dark night. But what really may have won the argument for Holloway was the intended weapons for each platform, just like he said. Because the F-16's design wouldn't accommodate an all-weather missile system without some extensive modifications, the Vought 1600 may have been able to manage carrier operations, but it still wouldn't meet the exacting needs of the Navy. Of course, the F-16 would eventually gain those very capabilities that it lacked at the time, both in the form of the Sparrow missile and eventually AMRAMs. Had similar capabilities been a part of the Vought 1600's pitch, we may not have seen the nearly four decades worth of service out of the Hornet and Super Hornet family that we have. Instead, the Navy would have been flying F-16s alongside F-14 Tomcats off their flat tops, and the Super Hornet would have been another of those what-if fighters I write about on Sandbox News. Of course, if you followed this channel for a minute, you know that the Vought 1600 wasn't the only legendary American aircraft that nearly found its way, or did find its way, onto Uncle Sam's carrier fleet. If you dug this story, I really recommend you check out some of our other videos. We've got a couple on efforts to put the F-22 and the F-117 onto carriers, as well as stories about actually flying U-2 spy planes and C-130s off of America's flat tops. And with that ends yet another edition of Sandbox News. My name is Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. Drop me a comment and let me know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.